God's grace, mercy, and peace belong to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus. Today we focus on this portion of the scripture from 2 Timothy chapter 4. The final verse reads this, The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To God be glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the words of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, who promised us that these days would come, my dear Christian friends. Jesus promised us that these days would come. When he talked to his disciples 2,000 years ago, he was very plain spoken about it. When Jesus explained the things that were going to happen and the signs that were going to happen in culture and in society in the days leading into and up to his second return, he was abundantly clear that these days would come. He said there would be wars, there would be rumors of wars. He said that there would be famines and earthquakes. He said that the family would break down and sons and daughters would betray their parents, their fathers and mothers, and as we read in our gospel lesson a few moments ago, would even want to put them to death. Because of the increase in wickedness, Jesus said elsewhere, the love of Christ the love of most will grow cold. Apathy. Rampant apathy. My goodness, people, all of those signs are all around us in our world now. Wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, they're happening all over the world. The breakdown of the family is happening right before our eyes. Parents and children betraying one another. Rampant apathy has been going on inside the Christian church for at least the last 50 years and certainly much longer even than that. Sometimes don't you get the sense, as you look in culture, as you look in society, sometimes don't you get the sense that the speed with which people are walking away from Jesus, the speed which which values and Christian morals are going away is so fast and so rapid that even people like us who want to gather around the Word of God and hear what Jesus has to say, even people like us who heed the Word of God and say we want to be faithful to the ends so that we can be saved, even we throw up our hands in defeat and say what can be done? It seems as though the devil and all of his minions, the demons, the unbelievers, and every other unchristian element in our world and in culture and in society, it seems like they're waging a full frontal offensive against Jesus Christ and his church. So what do you do? Well, if the devil feels as though he needs to go on offense, ought we not go on defense? What defense should we play? Our best defense, the Bible is going to teach us today, our best defense is the Word of God. In fact, our only defense is the Word of God. Our only defense is the Word of God because it comes as no surprise to you or me that the church and Jesus Christ has some very powerful enemies. I'm not teaching you anything that you don't know. This does not come as a shock and a surprise to you. This is not enlightened knowledge that the church has great enemies. The devil is an enemy of the church. The devil does not delight in seeing you worship at the feet of Jesus today. The devil does not want to see you to, uh, read the word of God. The devil does not want to see you go to heaven. The devil does not delight in the fact that you practice and worship Jesus Christ. The devil would love to see nothing than you ripped from God, ripped from church, and come to his side so that you might end up in hell rather than in heaven. And in order for the devil to do that, he preys on you and he preys on people with all kinds of a bag of tricks, but perhaps his most useful one is just simply to get, to get us to undermine the very first of all the commandments. You shall have no other gods. Hasn't the devil been doing this from the beginning? Wouldn't the devil much rather have you bow down and worship something else other than Jesus Christ? My goodness, why, why would you not become so selfish? Why would you not become narcissistic? Why would you not become greedy or filled with pride? Why would you not worship the world, the money, the hedonism, the pleasures, the entertainment? There are so many other things in which the devil would lure us to kick Jesus Christ out of his rightful throne in my heart and replace it with some other imposter. 
He's been doing this since the beginning of time, since he worked Eve over in the Garden of Eden in exactly the same way. Do you remember the three men in the fiery furnace? Do you remember when King Nebuchadnezzar, under the influence of the devil and unbelief, suggested that those three men, those three good Jewish boys, that they bowed down and worship his 90-foot-tall image of gold because we want to kick God out of your heart and worship an imposter. Do you remember what he just said to Daniel in our lesson that we had a little bit earlier? The king made an absurd decree that the only person who is to be prayed to for a month was the king. And when they went and found Daniel praying to the Lord God, he ended up thrown into the lion's den. Didn't the devil do exactly the same thing with Jesus Christ? When the devil tempted and taunted Jesus Christ, didn't he say, make your belly your God, turn these stones into bread? Didn't he say, all of this world will be yours if only you bow down and worship me? Time and time and time again throughout the course of human history, the devil has worked on you and worked on me in exactly the same way. He would much rather we throw up the worship of the true God so that we can bow down and worship some idol. How have the temptations come to you? Do you know? Do you see? How is the devil working you over in order to thrust Jesus Christ out of your life so that he no longer occupies the number one place of authority inside your heart, so that he does not sit on the throne inside you and rule your heart by faith? What does the devil tempt and taunt you with? Is it all the same things? Would the devil rather make you worldly? Would he rather have you acculturate and embrace all of the ideas of the world that fly in the face of Jesus Christ? Does he want to make you greedy? Are you tied to money? Are you tied to keeping up with the Joneses? Is it just simple selfishness? Is it simple pride and narcissism? Don't we know that the world revolves around me? All of these ways are the ways that the devil works on you and me, as he has been doing for all human history. So that Jesus is no longer worshipped, he wages this full frontal offensive against you and me and people in the church. Well, then we ought to play defense. And the way we play defense, the only way we play defense is through the Word of God. You know what the Word of God teaches. You know that the Word of God teaches us that every enemy that has ever tried to poke and pick and fight against the church has been defeated. You know that the Word of God has told us that sin is bad. Sin drags us down to hell. Sin makes a mess of my life and yours. Well, if sin is an enemy, we know that the Word of God has told us that the sin of the world has been nailed to Jesus Christ on the cross. Well, then that can't be an enemy any longer because Jesus has taken it all away. Is death our enemy? You know that the Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the third day, and if he did, then Jesus Christ has conquered death, and not only has he conquered it, but he's conquered it for all of us who believe in him. What enemies can there be that fight against the church that Jesus has not defeated? Is the devil our enemy? When Jesus died on the cross and rose again, he announced his victory to the devil and all of the demons in order that they understand beyond any doubt that Christ has won the victory over all. That not the devil, that not death, that not even sin can be an enemy to you and me. And he looks to you and me and offers us his victory over every enemy through faith. You remember singing it in the hymn? It was stanza three. Do you remember those great words that Martin Luther penned? Even though devils, <coughs> even though devils all the world should feel, all eager to devour us, we tremble not, we fear no ill, they cannot overpower us. This world's prince may still scowl fierce as he will. They can't harm us. He's judged. The deed is done. The devil can't hurt us because Jesus Christ has conquered all of our enemies. And the simple words of Jesus, the simple words of the Bible, have given it to you and they have given it to me by faith. 
If you want to defeat all of the enemies who are playing offense against us and against our faith, then our only defense is to hide ourselves in the words of God that teach us about Jesus Christ and his victory over every single enemy. Look, isn't that exactly the same way that all of the people of antiquity have defeated the devil and all of the enemies too? How did the three men in the fiery furnace defeat the enemies, uh, Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar says, bow down to this 90-foot tall image of gold. Oh, my king, we do not need to give an answer to you. We answer to an authority much higher to you, but we want you to know that you can throw us into a furnace. You can threaten that we might die a martyr's death. You can threaten that we're going to die anyway, but we want you to know that we are not going to forsake the one and only true God and bow down to this ridiculous image. How did Daniel, how did Daniel defeat the temptations and the attacks of the devil. The king made a ridiculous edict. Daniel just went back to his room and he prayed all the while as he had always done. And even when he was thrown into the lion's den, God honored his trust in the one true God by delivering him. How did Jesus defeat the devil when the devil came to him? Shouldn't you turn your, these stones into bread? You've been, you must be famished 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus throws a Bible verse back against the devil to send him running. When the devil offers, God, well, offers Jesus everything as far as his eye can see, Jesus offers the devil a Bible. It says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. At every single turn, all of the saints of antiquity have always played defense have defended themselves only in the Word of God. That's <coughs> what the Apostle Paul did too. When Paul wrote the words of our text, he had people running away from him and abandoning him. Paul was in jail. He was an old man. He was probably going to be very close to his death. And in the very opening verse, he says, Do your best, Timothy, to come to me, because Demas, since he loved the world, has deserted me. The devil seems to have gotten another one by way of worldliness. Paul says that my first defense, that's his trial, perhaps his hearing. He was being tried by the Roman government because he essentially was a Christian. He says that my first defense, nobody came to my support. Everybody deserted me. You can almost hear the pain in Paul's words. Here I have poured myself out for the good of the church. I have preached and taught the gospel my entire life. And now my moment of need comes. Now here's my time where I could probably use the support of some Christian friends, and they're all gone. But Paul follows that up immediately by saying, But the Lord stood by my side, and the Lord gave me strength, so that through me... The message of the gospel might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. Despite the fact that Paul could count on no one to be his friend in his moment of need, Paul defended himself to the Roman government who had him on trial because God stood by his side and according to the Lord's own word filled him with the wisdom and the messages of the words of God to stand up and give witness to Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection, so that all people, even the Gentiles, might hear it. Today is Reformation Sunday, the day in which we celebrate the fact that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and by Scripture alone. Many years ago, Martin Luther, nearly 500 years ago, Martin Luther who was born and raised inside the church, nailed 95, shall we say, concerns, theses, to the castle church door, suggesting perhaps we need to have a dialogue about some of these things, suggesting that maybe there's some things that are going on inside the church that we should talk about and pay further attention to. What do you suppose would happen when a young, promising, bright monk calls into question some of the church's teachings. The cardinals vilified him, Cardinal Cayetan. Soon he was brought on trial before the courts, the electors, the local rulers. Eventually, he was being called to account by Emperor Charles V himself. What do you suppose Martin Luther did? 
Were there people standing there by his side? No, they all deserted him just like they did Paul. Martin Luther stood trial all by himself, and they forced him, and they pressured him, and they put on the full court offensive to make him recant and take back the things that he had written. What would you have done when all of those offensive things are being pressed against you? What would you have said? Here's what Martin Luther said. He defended himself with the word of God. This is what he said. Unless you can demonstrate to me from the word of God that what I have written is wrong, I cannot and I will not take back even one thing. Here I stand. God help me. That same spirit of boldness, that defense alone in the Word of God, is what has been handed down to you and to me today, my dear Christian friends. The devil's not going to leave us alone. The demons, the unbelievers, are not going to leave us alone. God promised that. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, he said. We can expect the pressures, the anti-Christian pressures, to come to you and me. But we might always defend ourselves with the Word of God alone. It's the best defense we have. Jesus Christ crucified, Jesus Christ risen, has defeated all of those enemies. A victory that belongs to you and me today. Here we stand. God help us. Amen.